at Tally Ho, Jules Guides here, in which I wander around London and tell you fascinating facts. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you like these videos. Today, we're heading just down to uh, Surrey Keys, and a what better way to arrive than on the splendid, it's called an Uber boat, um, Thames Clipper or something. It's really quite a glorious way to travel down there, actually. Some people get to do this every day. I think it's rather pleasant. Just opposite Canary Wall, they used to have a pair of horns on a pole here for many hundreds of years. It was called Cuckold's Point. Is it was because back in there, like the 12th century, King John or something was found in the arms of a miller's wife from childhood. The husband, this miller, was a bit upset about it. And as recompense, King John let him have all the land as far as he could see. And it so happened that he could see uh, three miles from Charlton to Rotherhithe. So he said, look, you can have all that land as long as once a year you walk that route wearing a pair of buck's horns. That was, a, that was his recompense. It's a bit mean of him. Anyway, that's why that area is called Cuckold's Point. A cuckold is somebody who has had someone else sleep with their wife. Is that right? I think it comes from the word cuckoo, maybe because a cuckoo lays its eggs in another bird's nest. Anyway, it's sort of just that little area opposite Canary War. Smugglers and sailors or men in ladies' frocks I'll meet you all in heaven or down the Surrey docks Down the Surrey docks Excellent. So look, down that way, we've got Deptford. If you're doing this walk or something, you could actually watch my Deptford video, which starts just a little bit beyond there, but we're going to go this way instead and uh, we're starting here an excellent boundary stone. I'm very fond of boundary stones and I like it when they write the information so I don't have to remember it. <laughs> this is a stone marks the boundary between St Mary's Parish, Rotherhithe, and St Paul's Parish, Deptford until 1899. It also was where the Kent Surrey border was but it isn't actually its original position this was uh, this was nearby and I like the fact that they relocated it it shows that they care about these old things and they, they didn't just chuck it in the bin. Anyway good that like it let's go. I don't, I don't know why I'm singing the Dam Busters, because that's a completely different incident. But um, this, is, this is South Dock. There's quite a few of these docks. I mean, this one's been converted into a marina. And back in the 19th century, there were a lot more of these docks around here. A lot of them have been filled in. But this one was empty during the Second World War uh, to prepare the floating Mulberry Harbours. You know, for D-Day, the ships yeah. oh, that yes, were yes. carrying all the machinery and everything, they couldn't get close enough to the land in order for them to offload tanks and God knows what. So they had to create these floating Mulberry Harbours. They landed two and a half million troops and half a million vehicles before it was decommissioned. But anyway, this is where they assembled or got them ready. Feels like I'm on the south of France or something. <laughs> so I heard the miller's wife was a very pretty thing. Not just to the miller, but also to the king. Aha, look, the Tide Gauge House. This, in the old days, would have had a man in there to check on the levels of the tide and decide, you know, when these gates needed to be closed and whatnot. Because look, yeah, because look over here, down here in the ground, there are these kind of pistons and stuff. Now, I suppose these are probably what operate these gates over here, these big uh, lock gates, yeah. which are open at the moment. Enormous, aren't they? They're huge. And I think they are probably operated from that little cabin over there. So this, this little funny hut here that had the gauge or a bloke sort of measuring the tide or whatever. And then that, that little hut over there operated these pistons here. I think it did anyway. You see the bridge over there, that opens up. I don't know if it still does anymore. I don't think so. It looks like you can't go through anymore, but in the old days you could... Uh... No, it was swing around, look. You can see the wheels. Oh, right. Yeah, so yeah, that's why it it's called... Like it that's why it's called a swing bridge. Oh, it is called a swing bridge. Oh, then it, that's yeah. what it is then. <laughs> and, and, and all this machinery down yeah, here, look. Yeah, hydraulic hydraulic lock gate there. engine. The machinery was installed in 1902. The sluice gate inside the pit was raised and lowered using high pressure water. Beautiful engineering though, isn't it? I mean, it really is. And, and it looks great too. It's yeah. See you on the other side, Simon. Right? And I became the miller himself to watch their little fling. Oi! Now this next one is the biggest of all the docks and used to be called Howland Great Wet Dock when it was first built. 
back in like the 1690s, the Russell family, who were the Earls of Bedford, dug this massive dock on their land here, and it was used for refitting the ships for the East India Company. Do you remember when we were in, in Peckham, in a Peckham video, there was this kind of empty canal. It was like a Parkland walk. Route. Yeah, yes, yes. That was originally the Grand Surrey Canal, which back in 1807 ran all the way past here and connected Camberwell with the Thames. After the main docks got moved to Tilbury in the 1970s, they filled it all in. Anyway, in the 1700s, they renamed this dock Greenland Dock because it was famous for having all these whaling ships that came over here from Greenland and they used to boil blubber and stuff around in these boiling sheds in order to, I don't know, extract whale oil and things like that. These days it's more used for water sports and stuff around here. It really is massive, that dock. And oh look, here's James Walker. He was one of the main engineers here. He designed quite a few docks, I think that was his thing. Docks, you needed a dock. James Walker's your man. Are you going to talk about this rail? Probably a giant trolley, like yeah, a giant exactly. train tracks. Yeah. Loading, unloading, whatever, timber maybe, like you, you mentioned. Because the trees wouldn't have been here. There would be no greenery here. These trees are new. And the whole area was completely yeah. rejuvenated in the, in the 70s and 80s. Right, and yeah. Yeah. They look very 80s, don't they, those buildings there? Unrecognisable from how it was. And it's at the end of the dock here, it's one of these bascule bridges. I think we went over one of these in our whopping video. This would have connected the Greenland dock with, I don't know, there probably would have been a canal there going to one of the other docks, Canada dock or whatever. They pumped water into that container at the top and then that would come down and this whole section would lift up and you can see over here all the kind of, the lever, what would you call that? like a big cog. I love looking at this sort of stuff because it's the sort of thing that you might have as a toy or in your Meccano set or something, and a small version of this, but it's just on a giant scale. All these knobs yeah, sort like of go into Lego, these little yeah. bits. Yeah. Such beautiful stuff. I suppose it had to be beautiful though, in a way. I think it's the bolts as well. I mean, look at all the rivets and bolts. They sort of add to decoration because they become a pattern. I think this is Red Rift Road. I mean, this used to be Rogue's Lane back in the old days, because we're approaching Rotherhithe. This whole peninsula is kind of Rotherhithe, mm -hmm. really. And locals used to call Rotherhithe Red Riff. So in Old Saxon, Anglo-Saxon, one of those old languages anyway, Redra meant mariner, and Hithe meant haven. Redrahiv, which became Red Riff, and so people called it Red Riff back in those days. So it was like a haven for mariners. So it's actually indeed why Rotherhithe is called Royal Hive, because that's a landing place for cattle. Roder here or something. <laughs> I don't know how you pronounce it. Get your heels off her, he cried, I'll shoot your heart at dawn. You filthy, ugly sailor, I'll make you cry and mourn. We've just come around that little bit called Surrey Water. It's a rather nice lagoon with these rather newly built houses around it. And I'm going up to meet my friend Yen at the top of, of Stave Hill. It's a bit of a wall, but I call this the Avenue of the Grumpy Trees. <laughs> <laughs> because look, it's a Cyclops tree here. Every tree has a little spirit in it. Kind of angry looking grumpy tree. Looks like he's hailing a taxi, that one. Been waiting for ages. What are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Gronda Gronda, my lord, Gronda Gronda. Do you ever watch that, the adventure game? No, I've never seen that. Oh, I don't think. And Miller and Richard Stilgo alight on the planet Arg. <laughs> you never watched that? They had the vortex at the end. If thou murmurest, I will rend an oak and peg thee in its knotty entrails till thou hast howled away twelve winters. I always think of that quotation from The Tempest, where Ariel has been trapped inside a tree. Anyway, look, we're heading up this hill. This is at the top is Stave Hill, where you get a lovely view of the whole area. It's quite a long hill, this. It reminds me of being in, in Kill Bill. She has to climb the stairs to go and see Pi May. I'm like, oh no, not more, not more stairs. She better be here. <laughs> you brought me all the way up here. I was expecting to find you in a lotus position and sort of, uh, you know, floating <laughs> and meditating. That's the camera equipment that does everything. Exactly. This is where the magic happens. Oh. This is our highest point in Rotherhithe. You can see London here, yeah, all just all, all from this little hill. 
that's sort of risen from the waters in the 90s. So right now we'd be standing in the water, would we? Yeah, in Russia Dock. This is quite cool, look. So they've got the whole map of what the docks used to look like here. Look, we're here currently. This one is Russia Dock. This is Russia Dock, yeah. You can see all of these areas were underwater. All of these areas were docks that have now been filled over and turned into land that we can see around. So what have we got here? What's that building? So that used to churn out the Daily Mail, the Evening Standard and the Metro. And then in 2017, it was taken over by a company that was running nightclub events there. And it was voted the seventh best nightclub in the world by DJ Mag, which is quite <laughs> impressive for something here. Um, I think one of the what, seventh best in the world. What was the best? Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I need to see this list. I've seen it change so much. It's incredible. I mean, I've, I've been living here what, since the 90s. So here it used to be just very wild, no past. So it was just uh, grass that people were throwing rubbish to and there wasn't anything around. With the Russia Dock woodlands and this whole area now is also managed by a group of people and there are many, many volunteers who have come to transform the space. There's now lots of footpaths that they've created. Okay, and here you go. Welcome to the orchard. <laughs> the orchard. <laughs> see, he's even got a sign. The orchard. Is that, is that a pear? I mean, there must be apples. This is a pear. Right. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. That's an apple. Come on. Oh, it's apple. Oh, it just didn't look like... Oh, okay, it's an apple. There's lots of different sections of this park now. There's, uh, it's very a serene. Meadow. Yeah. No crime. Yeah. Perfect piece in the area. <laughs> Apart from apple theft. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Only trouble is, how the hell do you get out of it? I'm smugglers and sailors on many ladies' docks. I'll meet you all in ever or down the Surrey docks. Changed a bit. I used to know this place vaguely. Brother lived down here. This is Canada Dock and uh, it was built in 18, or opened in 1876 to hold grain and timber from Canada. Now it's called Canada Water. Completely different from in the 1960s. And look, there are some remnants, no? Look, more remnants of the old days. That building oh, over yeah. there, look. The superintendent's offices of Surrey Docks, built in 1887, that. Rather nice. I like all the mixture of different types of architecture. I think, I think they've done quite a good job, if I'm honest. Nice little reminders of what the area used to be like. I think these guys are called deal porters. Hardy working men. Yeah, look, just like me, that fella, normally. Ah, look, the Norwegian church of St. Olav. There's another church around here. There's a Finnish church as well. I think there's a Swedish church. One of them's got a sauna in it. I don't know which one. It was built in 1927. It was actually used by King Harkon VII of Norway to broadcast speeches to the Norwegians when they were under Nazi rule in the Second World War. But there was a lot of these Scandinavians who would be working in the docks and sometimes they might get stranded here and they would need somewhere to go and worship. So they, they built a few of these Scandinavian churches here. St. Olav's I really like because of its weather vane. If you watch my weather vane video, you'll see me going on about the, the great weather vane up there, which has got, I think that is St. Olav on it. Now, King Olaf was king of Norway and back in the 11th century, when London was occupied by Swain Thorkbeard, the son of Harold Bluetooth and husband of Sigrid the Haughty, old King Ethelred the Unready, he wanted to get London back. And so he enlisted the help of King Olaf of Norway, the guy riding his little boat there on the weather vane, to come and help him sail up the River Thames. And they tied ropes around the supports of London Bridge, like the old kind of rickety wooden London Bridge, whatever was there in those days. And he helped pull down the bridge, giving rise, some say, to the rhyme, London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down, London Bridge is falling down. My fair lady. Yes. <laughs> I had to think about that for a second. What the hell? I just sang it in such a long while. The singles out, the singles the out next on. week, folks. <laughs> <laughs>so you can't tell me about the building so the old mortuary it was built in the late 1800s because there's a bit of a bend in the river right here and 
my understanding is this is where the bodies would wash up. Oh. So this is why the, the mortuary was built here. It was a working mortuary until the 80s. We have turned it into a beautiful community center that doesn't feel at all like a mortuary. <laughs> okay, let's check it out. Devin, you're in danger of being on camera here. <laughs> yeah, the, the roof's good. Um, that's a lovely old original roof. Like, yeah, you'll notice that all of the windows are up very tall because this is where they would do the autopsies and things. Yeah. So you want a lot of light to come in, but you also want privacy so that the locals oh. are not having to see all of the icky bits. So they do that with me. My understanding is this beam up here is where they would hang the bodies. Ooh, oh, that Yes. All right, sure. Ah. As a sort of, I guess, like if you are in a meat locker with a butcher, you know, there, oh. this is, that's oh, what I'm picturing. So I don't know how accurate it was that they were hanging bodies from it, but this is certainly what I've been told. Yes. So now we are a community center that provides um, free activities for children under 11, supportive activities for older adults over 55, all ages. We've got a lot of gardening things going on now. Excellent. Not, okay. not death related at all. <laughs> Get your hands off and let me cry, they'll shoot your heart and lawn. You filthy ugly sailor. We've finished our other rather highs video in the Mayflower, but, uh, but yeah, we're not going to stop in there today. It's got a beautiful view of the Thames, and they say that some of the timbers from the actual Mayflower ship that sailed the Pilgrim Fathers to America were used to build the pub. I don't know if that's true or not. The Mayflower did rot away on the banks there, just on the river behind. Look up on there, they've got an old sign. It says Metropolitan Borough of Bermondsey. These days it's the borough of Southwark, so I suppose that's probably an old sign. But anyway, look at that. And above there you can see St. Mary Rotherhithe. Must be some sort of parish marker or something. In fact, that's the church of St. Mary's Rotherhithe just opposite. One of these graves here is the grave of Captain Christopher Jones, captain of the Mayflower. I don't know which one he's buried in. I think he's unmarked his grave. But the crew of the Mayflower were rather hive men. I heard it say that Jonathan Swift got the idea of Gulliver for Gulliver's Travels when he was in Rotherhithe. And uh, apparently he described the character so well in his book that Rotherhithe people swore blind that they actually knew the person that he was based on. As <laughs> Jonathan Swift never went up in a lift, nor did the author of Robinson Crusoe do so. It's my favourite poem. <laughs> anyway, so just opposite the church is this lovely school, um, old charity school. You can tell these charity schools because the, the figures wearing blue, the dye was very cheap kind of dye, it was, it was much cheaper to dye the clothes blue and that's why their uniforms were blue. But this one was founded by what Peter Hill and Robert Bell, I assume they were two seafarers who founded this school in 1613 so that the sons of their fellow sailors would have a place to be educated. And just along from there, look, there's the, there's the watch house. You've often got these watch houses in the cemetery, such as now a lovely, rather nice cafe. Uh, you've got these watch houses near cemeteries so they could keep an eye out for any grave robbers and for other misdemeanors. And just a little way along from the old fire station as well. So oh, nice. Smugglers and sailors, or men and ladies frocks, I'll meet you all in heaven or down the sunny dock. You dragged me kicking and screaming into here. You've changed into your... Uh, <laughs> I've changed, yes, because we need to be in proper attire. Simon's off uh, doing some filming, and we've gone for fish and chips because it is Fishy Friday, now, and I felt in the mood for fish and chips, but there's plenty of other things on the menu. Lawrence, is it? When I decided to open my own restaurant, I thought, where would I like to go for dinner with my partner? And all the restaurants I like to dine in are all Michelin starred and all really expensive. So I thought, simplicity, take good quality products, simply cook them at a good value price. We were listing the top three best cheap restaurants in time out. And I've been going since 2007, so. Yeah. Good job, and you've opened just for us, which is really kind. I have done. Much appreciated. Okay. Lovely chunky chips as well, very nice. Are of you course, a fan of the mushy peas? I love mushy peas. You have to have mushy peas with fish and chips. But this is very, very good. Jules Guides recommend. <laughs> I'll meet you all in heaven or down the sorry dogs. We did do a video about rather high than which I walk from Tower Bridge all the way up here and I feel a little bit annoyed because I left a few things out. I know I mentioned this before, which is that you can't go through Rotherhithe without mentioning the Brunel Museum, so vintage jewels will explain. This is now the Brunel Museum, but it used to be the engine house which pumped the water out from the original Thames Tunnel, which was the first underwater 
tunnel in the world. Brunel, now I get confused. There's two Brunels. Is Isambard oh, Kingdom yes. Brunel was, was the son. But I think Marc Brunel is the guy who designed this tunnel. He actually escaped from the French Revolution. His wife nearly got exiled. She was, uh, she was condemned to death in France because he was French. The Thames Tunnel was the Brunel's uh, big project. The dad Brunel and the son Brunel. Yeah. Yeah? The dad Brunel died during the construction. They got into a lot of uh, money problems, financial difficulties. Whilst he was in debtor's prison, he spotted a worm, apparently. It was like a, a special kind of worm that had a, a hard front and he, he'd burrow and sort of, I don't know, sort of remove the earth and put it behind him. And he had this special uh, method of tunnelling and it gave Mark Brunel the idea of how to to tunnel underneath water. And so he then showed the world how to do it. This is the engine house that they built for the tunnel. This there is the shaft. So I guess originally you'd go round and round this shaft to get all the way to the bottom. These days they do concerts and stuff down there. Originally it was a foot tunnel, but like everything in Jules Guides, it ended up attracting prostitutes, thieves and pickpockets. So they ended up selling it to the London Underground, and that's now where the trains run through. It's a nice, handsome, small station. It rather it? it is. I agree. We're back outside the Brunel Museum. I know we've just had fish and chips, but for the love of the art... We're having more food. Because Brother Hyde, would you believe, is a culinary centre. <laughs> no one would tell you that except me. But here we have a Vietnamese food truck van. <laughs> you have a choice of banh mi, which is the Vietnamese baguette, or rice or noodles. And here I would really recommend the baguette because it's very authentic to the way that it would be served in Vietnam. Well, I'm going to have the honey pulled chicken. Uh, what would you want that with? Yeah, I bake the baguettes myself every morning. Um, I wake up at 7 a.m. It's a Vietnamese recipe. Mm -hmm. If you know about the history of Vietnam, it was colonised by the French. Wheat was really expensive to import. They tried growing it in Vietnam, but the uh, tropical weather didn't work. And then uh, when they left the country and Vietnam became that. independent, the Vietnamese decided to uh, make their own baguettes. Okay. But because wheat was expensive, they had to use less wheat. So that meant the baguette was fluffier, lighter yeah. and crispier on the outside. Compliments to the chef. I know it's not New Year, but I should say chuck mang nam mui. That's half a year away. <laughs> oh, come on, it's only there to say Vietnamese. Chuck mang nam mui. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> These are good. No, this is very, very good. Thank you. Ooh. Highly recommended. The Love Yet van. Now, right next to the Love Viet food van and above the Brunel Museum, there's this beautiful secret garden full of herbs. The money that you pay goes towards the Brunel Museum as well, who are raising money to improve the shaft tunnel and you know bring it oh, back right. to its former glory. And the botanicals which I use in the garden are used to make the syrups and I use for the cocktails. Oh, it's called Midnight Apothecary. The roof garden. What, what do you suggest I have? Go for the Paloma. A Paloma? Yeah. All right then. <laughs> Why? Tequila base. Tequila base, that's the, that's the trick. But this is all made with stuff from the garden here. All stuff that's foraged locally. Oh, wow, cool. Oh, good. There's butterflies. I rather like this. I'm quite jealous of all the herbs here. Nothing seems to grow in my garden, but they've done a good job here. So these are all to be sampled in cocktails on Cocktail Friday, or whatever it's called. Midnight Apothecary. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. <laughs> we, we stopped here in Cherry Gardens. This is where uh, Samuel Pepys used to stop and buy his wife cherries after being down in Deptford. Do you remember in Deptford we were talking about oh, yeah. how he used to go and sleep with that shipbuilder's wife? down there and on his way back home he bought cherries for his wife he's a bit of a mean so and so and it's also from here that jmw turner painted the fighting temeraire oh, you know, that famous painting which is in the national gallery good day for mudlarking simon yes that's a tides out monica It's friend of the show, Monica. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you found anything good? So here's a box of treasures. These are ones I found earlier, not today, obviously. Oh, it's like a Blue Peter. It's like, it's like Blue Peter. So this, when I found it, 
was flat as anything, absolutely covered in the deepest, darkest mud you can imagine. No shape to it at all. And as I was pulling it out, I was thinking, what the blooming heck is this? And when I finally turned it around, I saw like a wooden shoe sole. It's made of alder wood. And alder wood is a really, really tough wood. It's like willow. It should have had a metal toe and a metal heel. Right. Um, to protect the wood from wearing out. But this shoe never had them, and there's a reason for that. It was a docker's shoe, oh. and the docker, if he had had metal taps, when he went on board a ship to unload, he would have damaged the deck of the ship. Yeah. The other thing also, if he had metal and he went into one of the big warehouses, the sparks could cause an explosion. Shoe. So how old so is that? Then? Did you this say? is about 1800 to 1850. You see, how do you yeah. know all this? How does she know all this <laughs> stuff? That's what I want to know. How do you know that? What else have you got in this box of tricks? What would your average person up there want to wear if they didn't want to walk in their muddy, dirty streets? The, yeah. the roads were really filthy. So basically, people would have these things. They're called patterns. Um, so this is, yeah, it's, it's basically a, a metal, almost like a stilt. And it would have had a wooden bit on there. And you'd have put it on your shoe like that. Oh, right. And then you'd tiptoe through the mud and it would lift you just to, you know, a couple of a inches bit. out of the slime so your skirts oh. wouldn't get too dirty. What's and it called women, again? A pattern. A pattern. pattern. Now we're talking 1600s Tudor times. So you'd also have these things which are really pretty. They're called little dress hooks and they've got a little hole at the top for a ribbon. You'd have the ribbon around your neck, your various different skirts going, generally a grey overskirt, which was very demure, but your petticoat might be red and quite, quite pretty. You'd kind of want to show off your petticoats, but you were pretending that you were trying to keep your skirts clean from the mud. And you would use these and you would hook them up and you'd hook up your overskirt to allow a little bit of your pretty red underskirt to show. It dates from about the time the Mayflower was found not that far away from it, and it has IHS on it, which is basically the first three letters of Jesus. But in the Greek alphabet, Jehovah starts with an I. Jehovah. It yes, belongs it in a museum. And the last thing I've got um, is a padlock um, that was owned by the Quinney brothers. Oh, look at and that. And it was in Paradise, they were in Paradise Road, which is literally around about a minute and a half walk. But when I cleaned it off, it was really lovely because just here, WM and A Quinney, London, but Quinney, turns out he was a nail maker and he had a warehouse a stone's throw from here. And this was obviously one of the padlocks that tried to stop people from nicking their nails. But this dates to about 1880, this padlock. So we're uh, taking this back to its home. We're rehousing this, uh, this lot. Over there would be Mr Quinney's three major warehouses. And the poor bugger, if he came back now, he wouldn't recognise them anymore, would he? <laughs> no, they've been uh, no. flattened yeah. by the council exactly. or by the Luftwaffe. Oh, there, look, there it is. It's home at home, <laughs> sweet home. Cheers, Mr Quinney. <laughs> <laughs> It's called the King's Stairs, this little bit around here. Actually, look at these remnants here of the 14th century manor house built by King Edward III. I would have been standing in the moat right now, I reckon. There was a moat that went all around this manor house. According to that sign up there. Yeah, it's a bit beyond repair now, and it? it is a ruin. Could do with getting the builders in. That's, that's a lovely pub there, though, the Angel, which I keep meaning to go to, this one here. But... Uh, this is a 15th century, it's been a pub here since the 15th century and uh, it's famous for its smuggling, you know, because in, uh, they've got these trap doors out the back which the right. smugglers used to use, so they wouldn't have to pay taxes oh, yeah. or something. And then just over there you've got Alfred Salter, uh, this kind of thing which we spoke about in, uh, in my Benches video, but That's right, some yes. people didn't watch my no. Benches video, Simon, so let's cut to Vintage Jewels who will explain all about the uh, statues over there. And just over here is Alfred Salter, who was a much-loved MP back in the 1920s. This whole ensemble here of statues and this fellow on the bench is, is it's known as Salter's Dream. Now, Alfred Salter was a doctor originally who lived near here, and he entered politics in order to help improve living conditions for the poor. And, of course, being a doctor, he saw the effect that living in slums had on people's health, and he set up mutual health insurance schemes, started treating people for free. And together with his wife, they worked on improving conditions in the Bermondsey slums by building houses like those that we saw in Wilson Grove around the corner. There used to be a, another version of him, but someone stole him. I don't know, I don't know what, but I felt a bit sorry for him because the other one, he looked a lot more comfortable. He was sort of reclined on a nice bench. His wife over there, Ada, she 
It's one of the only 20 statues of women in London. She's carrying a spade because she campaigned to get some of the public spaces turned into playgrounds for children. Ada's concern for working women led to her election in 1909 as the first woman councillor in Bermondsey and the first Labour woman councillor in London. This must be the daughter who died of scarlet fever. Some say that her death could have been avoided if they had taken her out of the school here and sent her to a posh place elsewhere, but they decided to stay living in amongst the, the slums here in Bermondsey. But unfortunately, it didn't do her any good and she ended up dying. As for the cats, I think that's just a cat. I'll meet you all in heaven or down the sorry docks. I'll meet you all in heaven or down the sorry docks. I'll meet you all in heaven. Cheers. Cheers, Simon. Cheers, Jan. Thanks, everybody. Don't forget, if you like the video, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you want to know more about me, you can check out my website, jewelsguides.com, where you can leave donations and do all sorts of other exciting stuff. See you next time. I'll meet you all in heaven or down the Surrey docks.